Hi, good morning and happy early afternoon to everyone joining us from farther east. Welcome to episode four of Navigating New Space, produced by the Matthew Isakowitz Fellowship Program. For any new viewers this week, the MAP Fellowship is a highly selective summer internship and mentorship program, which nurtures the ethical and ambitious exploration of space in the new leaders of the next generation. Through candid conversations with our program's mentors and fellows, we hope to bring you some insight into the mechanisms of the rapidly changing world of new space. My name is Shana Hume, and I am the host for this segment and a 2018 alumni of the program. Today, I'm so excited to introduce you to the second of our mentors to join us here, Rob Meyerson. Rob is the founder and CEO of Delaloon Space, a management consulting company focused on aerospace, mobility, technology, and investment sectors. Formerly, Rob was also the president of Blue Origin until 2018, where he built the company from scratch into more than a 1,500 person organization. Under Rob's leadership, Blue Origin developed the New Shepard system for suborbital human and research flights, a family of liquid rocket engines, the New Glenn launch vehicle, and of recent fame, the Blue Moon Lunar Lander. Rob, welcome to the little segment. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Shana. I'm really, really happy and honored to be here. So thanks for having me. Yeah. It's so exciting to have people who have been involved with commercial space since its very inception be so involved with the program because it helps us to see where we've been and how the last decade has really brought us to the situations that we find ourselves in today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure is. It's been uh, it's been an exciting change. And uh, I, I feel like I've been involved in multiple phases of what people like to call new space or commercial space, starting going back to the second half of the 1990s. So uh, when I left NASA to go to Kistler Aerospace. What was that first involvement like? Well, it was um, it was interesting and, and, and you definitely have to be adaptable because markets change. And um, and so and what I mean by that is we saw the the first uh, wave of big Leo constellations proposed and many of them disappeared. Uh, companies like Teledestic uh, went out of business um, and companies like Iridium and Global Star and um, Orcom had to restructure uh, and pivot to, um, to make it. And it took, it took time for them to make it, but they eventually did. Um, so it, uh, um, when I was at Kistler Aerospace, you know, we built the company and it was pretty much structured around flying those constellations, Iridium, Teledesic, uh, and when they uh, went into financial troubles, we had to pivot and, and reinvent the company uh, around um, NASA flight technologies and and um, look, looking at the uh, commercial cargo resupply for the International Space Station and other things. So, and that you know that got us a little further, but ultimately the company did go out of business. Uh, later, though, um, being a part of uh, designing and building the first reusable rocket uh, and the recovery of New Shepard was uh, just, uh, you know, just an unbelievable um, uh, experience. And I'm, I, it really was an honor. I, I think when you when you look back, it, it was an honor and it was really just fun to be a small part of, of that history. You know? Definitely. What are some of the big changes today in commercial space as compared to the past? Well, I think, you know, most recently it's, it's the Demo-2 mission. I mean, SpaceX flying to the International Space Station and then just coming back and, and seeing Doug and Bob come back just a few weeks ago, uh, it's, it changes a lot. It really does. It opens up the opportunities for commercial low-Earth orbit uh, because there's finally a way to get people there um and get cargo there and so if we can start to build on that you see companies like axiom space um winning contracts and and starting to generate some interest uh just over the last six months um primarily because of that uh, uh spacex hitting that milestone you know uh, due to the you know the long-term commitment and um and push from nasa and their commercial crew and commercial cargo programs so those, those are the big changes that I've seen. I, I think it's a, it's a very exciting step for us here in 2020. 
Absolutely. This year had so many different firsts between Demo 2 and everything with Percy heading to Mars. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been a lot of excitement in the social networks of space. Yeah, yeah. Over, yeah. So one question that I did really want to ask you is you've had experiences working as, you know, a younger engineer in the very beginnings of the commercial space industry and then later as a leader in some of the biggest companies uh, that are pursuing different goals uh, on the moon and hopefully towards Mars soon. So given that, what lessons do you feel like you've learned in that career? that you would want to pass on uh, to maybe some of the young people who are involved in these programs? Wow, well, well, it's not a lesson to learn, but definitely do it regardless of what I say. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the uh, um, there's a few things that I, I think about. I've had a lot of time to think about um, those lessons and I'm at a point in my career where I do a lot of mentoring. So I thought, you know, and uh, I thought through some of these, these items and, and and one is it's, um, you know, space and tech companies are, are, are very different. So constraints do, you know, drive innovation, but within reason you have to, um, you need a certain like size, critical mass of a company to get things done. And you can, you can adjust that, that size can be smaller if you, if you buy more components um, versus making them. Um, but, but that's the, critical size uh, needs to be, you know, uh, in in a certain level. Um, I look back on my time at Blue Origin from 2003 to 2018, uh, really the average headcount we had uh, was less than 300 people. So uh, it was a very, very small company. Um, so that's one thing. I think um, success requires leadership at all levels. It's not just the the head of the company or the senior managers that are um, our leaders. Uh, everyone in the organization can be a leader, and um, and that shows in the way that you behave, the way you um, take on new tasks, the way you deal with uh, with change, and um, you know negative. You know what some people can view as negative, um, um, uh, you know uh, outcomes. How do how do you deal with those and um, bring the team along, bring the team forward? Um, I think another lesson learned, lesson learned is really about process. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's process and procedures and financial metrics and reporting are all important, but they can't replace, you know, good judgment in your people, um, integrity and trust. You, you need to have, uh, those things have to balance. And, um, and so that's, that's one other important lesson. Uh, I think, you know, uh, one thing we were just talking about just before the beginning of the show started, it's really about ambiguity um, and adaptability. Uh, learning how to um, work within an amb ambiguous situation. I like to develop scenarios and look at um, what are the different possible outcomes here. Um, and that better prepares you for what is actually going to happen when you when you don't know you know um, exactly what's going to happen? Um, and, and in space, it's dependent on so many things. It's dependent on NASA and the budget. It's dependent on international partners. It's dependent on the competitive landscape. So uh, um, so understanding how to manage ambiguity is 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 one really important lesson learned. Um, and I think I'll I'll close with just the importance of your network. Um, I think developing a network, um, uh, cultivating that network, you know, going to picking a few events to go to every year, uh, conferences, um, and and not just accepting LinkedIn invites, but actually, you know, um, managing, you know, getting to know people uh, within your network and and making sure you're you're there for them when they need it and vice versa. So. Uh, yeah, those are all some great lessons. Uh, a follow-up question to one of the first ones you mentioned. You talked about how you know young and entry-level employees can still have good judgment and leadership and how that can make a big difference. Looking down from the upper levels of an organization, what would that look like to you? Well, uh, I, I like to think about you know the scenarios um, 
when we are working in the office uh, around the coffee pot. Um, what what do people talk about? And um, who's the person that um, that says, wow, you know, um, Rob just said, we're going to go do this. And I don't know how we're ever going to get there. Um, and who's the person who's heard the same thing and says, wow, um, you know, it's going to take, we're going to have to do, these are the things we're going to have to do to get there. And those are two very different, you know, glass half empty, glass half full um, reactions. But certainly the one that you want, and you want both, you want skepticism, but you want, you know, healthy skepticism is good, but you also need, you know, those optimists who can uh, pull the team forward, get the team motivated and go because you can't, you can't be everywhere as a leader. So you need leadership at all levels. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Hopefully yeah. optimism and good judgment come together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and learning from your mistakes as well. Yes. <laughs> so Always. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that cultivating your network is another thing that you like to stress uh, as one of the lessons learned. Before uh, we had this segment, you and I have already talked about how communities are really important in propping up your career and helping you forward. What impact has mentoring helped you get to where you are today? Wow. Um, everything. <laughs> So I don't, yeah. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be where I am today without um, mentors that helped me along. And I think of um, mentors in two distinct categories. In my experience, they've been, you know, there's been the technical mentors who really helped me form that base. And these are, these are folks at, at NASA Johnson Space Center um, who I worked with very closely. People like Paul Romere, uh, Joe Gamble, um, Dave Knipe, and Chris Saramelli uh, were my earliest uh, mentors, technical mentors, uh, when I was a NASA co-op and a young engineer. Um, these are folks who, who worked on the space shuttle program. Uh, they just, you know, they literally sat down with you, rolled up their sleeves and, uh, um, and taught, you know, taught all the things you didn't learn in, in school. Um, I had some great career mentors too, and th those started in school. I went to University of Michigan. Uh, Professor Harm Buning uh, was our undergraduate advisor. Uh, and uh, an extra expert in astrodynamics. Um, he's the one who steered me to NASA Johnson Space Center. He actually uh, ran the co-op program at Michigan. Um, uh, Mr. John Kiker, who was a, a member of the original space task group, uh, which became the Johnson Space Center. Um, he taught me all about parachutes um, and he introduced me to the importance of a professional network. Um, and then uh, Dick Kors, who was our chief engineer at Kessler Aerospace, and he was the um, Space Station Freedom Program Manager at NASA. Um, uh, he taught me how to stay calm, uh, and he taught me how to look for heuristics and rules of thumb in every discipline so that you can actually really understand the, the basics of, of what's going on in a multidisciplinary um, project like anything in aerospace. Um, I think... Uh, as you rise up in your career and you get to higher levels, uh, coaching is very important. And the relationship between an executive or, or a manager and their coach is, uh, is uh, really key. Uh, and I highly recommend coaching for, for managers, new managers um, or managers at all levels. Um, and, and I think a good coach will, will teach you how to solve the kinds of problems that only humans can create. Uh, they're not telling you what to do. They're really teaching you how to approach the problem and look at it. Um, and uh, I, I love this question because it's it's so important uh, that in this phase of my career, um, I've chosen to um, do things. Uh, I chose to start Dell All in Space so that I could actually book, you know, some important, significant subset of my time to to spend mentoring and giving back um, to the community. You know, um, in in part as a thank you to all the strong mentoring that I got in my career, so. Absolutely, wow. I have a million follow-up questions. Uh, first of all, that one mentor that you mentioned, what did he teach you about parachutes? Oh my goodness, uh, yeah. So so John Kiker um, grew up in North Carolina. He, uh, he's, you know, passed away uh, back in the 90s. Um, 
but uh, uh, he went to work at Wright Field, which is now Wright Patterson Air Force Base, um, part of AFRL. Um, he uh, got to work with a, a group of, you know, group of engineers learning all about how to design parachutes for recovery of cargo and deceleration of, of airplanes. Um, he went to NASA Langley, um, became part of the space task group and moved to Houston and was one of the original leaders of the mechanical systems department in, in Houston at NASA Johnson. Uh, he retired in, I believe, 1980, uh, but then he came back and um, uh, as a you know retiree consultant to work on the space shuttle orbiter drag suit, which was a recommendation uh, from the Rogers Commission uh, after the Challenger accident, and they uh, they recommended that NASA add margin into the space shuttle landing and rollout subsystem. So the drag suit was one of one of those recommendations, and that was my first project coming out of school. So. Uh, Paul Romier, who I mentioned earlier, basically assigned me this project as the aerodynamicist to work on this team um, that uh, Don, Don Kiker was a very senior advisor on. And he took me under his wing and uh, he, you know, introduced me to the industry. He introduced me to uh, the AIAA uh, Aerodynamic Accelerator Systems Technical Committee, which I later became a part of. Um, he introduced me to people who had worked with him on the Apollo um, uh, Earth landing system, uh, which is the parachute system. Uh, people like Chuck Lowry, who um, was at Rockwell, later retired, came back to Rockwell to work on the drag suit. So, uh, and what I found in this industry um, <laughs> was uh, just an extremely passionate group of people that worked on a problem that was incredibly difficult because imagine you've got a you know you've got a, a bag of rags literally and you throw it out into the airstream and it catches the wind and it, it has to open up it has to stay in one piece um and decelerate whatever whatever it is that you're bringing back like a dragon capsule or a very large airplane or or um or cargo and um and so Parachutes are used by the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, uh, for military weapons and, of course, for NASA. So uh, um, I found a very uh, welcoming community uh, to, to join as a young engineer. So, um, Yeah. Wow. I love that so much. Uh, going through my first few internships, I had similar experiences. There would be someone from the old guard whose entire life was dedicated towards just knowing one technology and mm -hmm. the breadth and depth of what they could do with that knowledge always astounded me. It's incredible how much they were able to do. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very cool. Well, <laughs> thank you. That was a very selfish question on my part, but I had to ask <laughs> after you dropped that down. So that was exciting for me to hear. Um, so you're one of our mentors for this program and you give back in a lot of ways as a mentor uh, and we're all very grateful for that, obviously. I know I can say the same sentence from the other end of a career. Uh, my mentors are making everything for me happen and I would not be able to move forward after my PhD without them. So as you know, the other side of the coin, uh, as one of our mentors who helps other young engineers move forwards, what for you makes a very successful mentoring relationship? What makes that more than just another item in a network? Well, it, it, um, I think you, you, uh, it, it takes time to develop that mentoring relationship. I think uh, uh, maybe a commitment of time more on the mentor in the beginning. Um, I think many of these uh, mentorships can over time turn into friendships and, and they become mutual because at, at some point you are um, established in your career and, and um, you're, you're, you know, sometimes the, the help goes both ways. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's technical and career mentors and I, I really like to focus on the career mentoring. I, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I wouldn't make a great technical mentor. I don't think that's what um, 
uh, people are looking for when when I um, when we decide to work together. And certainly in these fellowships like Matthew Isakowitz and Brooke Owens, um, these are definitely career mentoring relationships. Um, I, I think the key is though that uh, um, what makes a successful relationship is uh, um, is that uh, passion for um, for growth. Um, obviously, um, it doesn't have to just be about space. It can be about about engineering or or growing into a leadership role. Um, but uh, in in the case of the the um, uh, mentoring relationships I'm into, they're they're mostly around space. So there's passion for mission, uh, and um, I'm looking for. I like you know working with people that want to grow, that are very excited about growing, uh, and um, and it uh, it you know it over time it just develops into a natural conversation you know about um, answering particular questions that uh, that come up in that in that person's uh, life and uh, and being able to share some of the experiences that I've had that uh, that are relevant. What's the difference between a career mentor and a coach to you? Well, I think the you know the the coach is, I mean, there is a transaction. You're usually paying for a coach, and so there there is a difference there. Um, but I think that um, when you're in a leadership role, uh, so so let's you know let's start with you're an engineer, you're an individual contributor, and at some point in your career, uh, if you're seeking that. You may become you may become the boss of, of your peer. Um, that's a challenging transition, and the conversations you have with peers, um, you can't have the same kinds of conversations all the time. Uh, so, um, I found the coaching relationship does help with that. Um, in terms of understanding how um, you know how to manage those relationships, how to manage those conversations managing both down and, and up um, because it's uh, it's very rare that you don't have to manage up. <laughs> um, there's there's very few people in the world that are uh, uh, blessed with not having having to manage up and um, and those and those challenges are, th those those are um, different relationships or difficult relationships to manage uh, uh, depending on where you are in your career so mm. that makes sense. So, uh, can I ask you about your current projects about Ascend and Delalune? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Ascend is um, is a project I've been working a lot on. I started. Um, it's an AIAA event uh, that is really going on now. Or actually, our first summit will be tomorrow. Uh, and if you are interested, it's um, uh, Ascend Events um, is the website and. Um, what I'm doing for Ascend is uh, uh, I'm, I'm serving as the executive producer, so I'm helping AIAA create a new outcomes-focused uh, space event uh, that will not just uh, speak to the space industry, but also speak to the adjacent markets that will eventually grow the space industry. And I'm talking about um, industries like mining, uh, infrastructure, construction, um, medical, pharmaceuticals, telecommunications. So, so tomorrow in our summit, we have a, a session on telecommunications and um, it's about three hours of content. There's two different sessions. One is focused on um, how the terrestrial telecommunications industry and the space industry um, are and can work, work uh, are and can work together um, to um, bring Fourth, you know, the 5G network that uh, is coming into um, reality today, uh, and then the future networks that'll um, give us uh, connectivity uh, when we're living and working in space and on the moon. So uh, we have representatives from from NASA and SpaceX and um, uh, Hyundai Air, Mo Air Mobility, uh, as well as um, uh, American Tower and. Uh, they're the, the world's largest uh, or one of the largest uh, cell tower companies uh, and Loon, which is a, um, a company that's developing balloon borne um, connectivity. Uh, the second session is really around rural broadband and it's focused on long haul fiber uh, installation. How do we address these um, these quote technology deserts that are around the US and around the world? Um, and so this includes um, it's moderated by a gentleman from Arcadia Infracom. 
but it also includes uh, representatives from Microsoft, um, uh, Azure from the from the hyperscale data center side, as well as um, um, networking companies, uh, Viasat, uh, and uh, Made in Space. So um, it'll be a very interesting discussion. We're trying to bring those discussions together um, in Ascend um, throughout the year and in the uh, the Ascend conference, which of course will be virtual, uh, is November 16th through 18th. And it's three days covering commercial, civil, and national security space. So uh, super proud of the keynote speakers we brought in. Um, some of the other things I'm doing, I'm, I'm, um, I'm on a couple of boards. Uh, one of them is Hermius, it's a hypersonics company based out of Atlanta. Uh, I joined Hermius when they were pre-seed startup, uh, and now they've uh, completed their first fundraise and, and recently were awarded a, uh, a contract with the Air Force Research Lab for a Mach 5 um, uh, version of Air Force One executive airlift. So uh, um, it's an exciting exciting team, exciting project. And uh, um, and then I'm also doing some pro bono boards, uh, the Seattle Museum of Flight, and then the University of Michigan um, College of Engineering Leadership Advisory Board. So staying involved in in a lot of different areas. So. Absolutely. That's more than very involved, in my opinion. But <laughs> I'm not surprised that you're a workaholic somehow. I think most of us are. <laughs> well, um, so one additional thing that I wanted to ask is with all of these different projects, you know, you're covering a lot of different bases, helping people reach specific goals in aerospace, uh, mentoring, teaching when you help out in Seattle, as you just mentioned. What vision do you have for yourself going forward? Where do you want to take these projects and what do you hope to do next? Well, um, I, I think uh, we're getting close, you know, I think in the late 2020s, 2030 timeframe, we're getting close to the point where um, businesses can be built on top of the services that, um, that NASA is really instigating was really funding so when you look at commercial crew and cargo um, we have multiple sources for delivery of people and cargo to low earth orbit uh, with gateway logistics services um, which was awarded to spacex we have at least one source for getting cargo to the gateway um, the uh, uh, hls and clips landers there's multiple sources uh, being developed for um, delivering small and large cargo to the surface of the moon. So so what do we need to fill in? We need to find ways to get that cargo back, um, you know, from the surface of the moon and, and it could come back on, on Orion or some other, or a gateway logistics service. Um, and so this, I'm excited to see, um, you know, the first startup that is um, doing business in the lunar ecosystem that doesn't have to design and build their own spacecraft or launch vehicle. They're buying a service from someone else. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, and so if you can do that, then um, what kinds of business plans for research and development are going to close, and um, and what you know what business are going to take advantage of the environment of the moon? You know the hard vacuum, the one six gravity, uh, the thermal gradient, and radiation. What can we build on top of that? So. Uh, um, you know, in my lifetime, I hope to see um, uh, an economy that is a lunar economy that's that's thriving and supporting transport um, uh, to low Earth orbit and to the moon and Mars. Um, just like we're in the very beginnings of creating a, um, a low Earth orbit economy. So. Sorry about that. I briefly got added and removed from the stream, <laughs> but glad to be back on. <laughs> uh, so it's easy to convince a space nerd of how exciting a lunar economy would be. I know that it's one of my favorite topics right now. Uh, but to bring us to our final question, the one that I've been asking all of our guests so far, this is an insane year and it is not over and none of us expect that it's gonna be easy sailing from here on out. A lot of people who are already in the space industry, we understand the value and the spin-off technologies that come with spaceflight. But for those who are outside of our circles and who this might all be a little bit new to, given everything happening, mm -hmm. 
how do you justify space to those who don't see the value in it that we do? Well, I, that, that's a great question. And, and there certainly are um, challenges on earth. I think, I think we really, um, you know, space will become a business um, opportunity at some point. Um, I mean, it is, it is for many companies now, but, but as far as a self-sustaining business opportunity, that's the kind of thing I was talking to in the answer to the previous question. Um, inspiration is, 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 uh, is critical. Um, and I think that uh, we do need some inspiration. Um, I think that uh, we're showing, particularly in Ascend, um, how uh, spin-off technologies from space are improving life on Earth. Um, I think we'll see that in um, the growth of uh, telecommunications. I think we'll see it in space medicine. Uh, and at Ascend, we're trying to um, look at both ways how investments in space are helping terrestrial companies and vice versa. Um, there's there's some in the in the mining industry, for example, that are that are applying, you know, space industry lessons learned to improving improving the mining industry. Um, I, I think uh, you know it gets back to exploration though, and um, and space is that frontier is as a uh, um, you know, whether whether we need to be multi-planetary because we want to preserve Earth or because we want to create a new um, uh, civilization on Mars or some other planet, um, it's still it's still worthy to go explore and go learn as much as we can. I think we can learn things uh, on the moon, which is just a few days away, that can apply to to those those needs to explore, uh, and um, and that gets us to you know, to going to Mars and going, going to other things. So I think that's how I would, I would justify it. So. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Now to close up for today, space changes very quickly, more quickly sometimes than some of the stuff flying around in it. Uh, so for everyone who is trying to keep up to date with it, whether it's because they're an amateur and they just love to learn about a new and exciting topic, or they're entering the industry themselves and they're just trying to get a grip on all the changes, what ways do you recommend that people stay up to date with space? Well, um, going to an event or two a year is a really good idea. And we're not, you know, we're not necessarily able to do those live right now. Um, so what I what I read is um, I read AIAA D Daily Launch, which is uh, um, provided to it's a clipping service provided to all AIAA members. Uh, I read Space News, I read Aviation Week, Space Policy Online, Politico Space, things like that via satellite and Ars Technica. Um, but I also read um, uh, press from adjacent industries like Fierce Wireless is one that I've started reading in the last year. Um, it's a um, really good to stay up to date on the telecommunications industry. Um, and, and then the industry conferences, um, you know, in the absence of those, um, you know, going to these events online, it's very hard to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I, I usually, you know, I try to reach out um, to specific people within the network and try to stay connected and do that every, you know, three or four months to, to try to, just a, you know, make sure that we, we know what each other's up to. And, and, um, and I think that's an important thing to do. Um, I recognize we get the Zoom fatigue. It's, it's exhausting, but I think as, as humans, we also want to want to stay connected to, uh, to uh, everyone. And, and, uh, and I'm, that's just uh, another, another thing that I add to the list to go do. And I'm genuinely interested in, in hearing from yeah, I would hope that despite all of the challenges we're facing this year, that people are finding ways to stay connected. I know that big portions of the space industry and especially young people in the space industry are trying to create free events to do just that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've personally had a good experience with them, despite yeah. the Zoom fatigue. <laughs> Great. So if people want to follow up with your work, where can they find you and keep up to date? Well, uh, LinkedIn is the best way to reach me. So you can find me, Rob Meyerson, on LinkedIn. So. Great. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. You're, you're welcome, Shana. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye.
For everyone else who's still online, if you'd like to learn more about the Matthew Isaacowitz Fellowship and applications, which will be opening shortly, please go to matthewisaacowitzfellowship.org or join us on social media at Matt Fellowship. We'd be happy to talk to you and answer any questions you have. Have a great day, everyone.